If you have your Bibles this morning, let's turn to, to Luke's account of the book of Acts. Luke's chap, Luke, excuse me, Acts chapter 2. We'll be looking at only verse 24 this morning, but we'll read a good part of chapter 2 for some context. As you're turning there, it's important to understand that history has no shortage of critics of the resurrection. Even since our own Lord's death and his burial, when the religious leaders began propagating that Jesus' body had been carried away by his disciples, there, that there have been lines and lines and critics after critics of those who have stepped forward claiming the resurrection never occurred. And yet, as the only true authority, the only true God, through the inspiration of the scripture, he provides both a clear defense of the resurrection as well as explaining the spiritual realities that it produced. And in doing so, the Bible affirms and speaks as plainly about the resurrection as it does of any other event, place, or person. Throughout the gospel accounts and into the rest of the New Testament, the scripture gives clear testimony that Christ did indeed die and he did clearly rise again. If you were a Jew, the truth and the understanding of a resurrection would not have been foreign to your understanding of the scripture. In fact, the Old Testament scripture spoke clearly of a future resurrection. Job Speaking in the oldest book of the scripture communicated this reality in Job 19, 25 through 26 when he said this, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. Job, by faith, looked ahead to a redeemer, one who would redeem him from sin and would provide him with an eternal inheritance. He was so sure of this that even though he said that he would die, that is to say that even though his flesh would perish, he was fully assured through the resurrection that he would see God. So any person familiar with the Old Testament, would have understood and been convinced of a future resurrection. It's with this understanding here in Acts chapter 2 that on the day of Pentecost, that day in which the church was officially born through the promise of the Holy Spirit, that Peter then stands before those Jews who had come from the, the various lands and who had witnessed the miraculous evidences of the coming of the Spirit that he now stands before the newly birthed church and preaches the first Christian sermon. It's here in Acts chapter 2 that the main theme of his sermon revolves around not merely the crucifixion of our Lord, but more importantly and clearly from verses 24 to the end, his sermon focuses on the resurrection as the crowning jewel and the defining work of Christ due to his unique nature. And in doing so, he proved that to Israel that Christ was indeed their Hamashiach, their Messiah. It's in verse 24 this morning that Peter teaches those there that day that it was God who in raising his son from the dead demonstrated the eternal reality of his nature, his victory over death, and his power to secure eternal life to all of those who believe. Let's read our passage this morning from Acts chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 14 and read down through verse 24. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. 
Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will be in those days, pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And in verse 24, a passage this morning, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. It's here in verse 24 that in his sermon, Peter wants us to see four realities of the resurrection of Christ. The first of those realities is at the source of the resurrection. The source of the resurrection. Peter begins this section with the phrase, but God. The word but here tells us that in Peter's sermon, he is making a distinct contrast, a shift in his argument. He is contrasting that which has been previously stated. So the question is, is what is he contrasting here in verse 24? Well, look in verse 23. He said this, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. It is here that Peter clearly identifies what action that God accomplished in resurrecting his son that was in contrast to what Israel had done. It is here that Peter lays out the clear indictment against the Jewish people. That they were personally and they were individually responsible for the rejection of Christ as their Messiah and they were guilty for his death. Language that Peter uses here in this verdict clearly illustrates their guilt for putting their Messiah to death. Peter states what? You nailed him to a cross. If you know anything of the gospel accounts of our Lord's crucifixion, you know that the gospel writers give clear testimony that it was the Romans who carried out the excruciating act of our Lord's crucifixion. But it is here that Peter, under the inspiration of the Spirit, gives clear testimony as to who the true executioners were. Peter says, it was you, the Jews, who put Jesus to death. While they did not personally drive the nails into our Lord's hands, while they did not beat him, while they did not plunge their spear into his side, Peter says that they were guilty of his death. They were the ones who falsely accused him. They were the ones who incited the crowd against him. And they were the ones who called for his blood and his crucifixion. The Jews here could not, con could not claim any kind of innocence of the crucifixion of Christ. And it is here that Peter notes the means by which they used. He says what? It was at the hands of godless men, Romans, that the Jews were able to carry out their devious wishes. But notice here, the first part of verse 23, Peter says this, This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Peter here describes for us, is the reality of God's sovereignty and control over all of the events of the crucifixion while simultaneously holding these men completely responsible for their actions. Peter has just clearly pronounced the Jewish people's guilt in crucifying our Lord. He has just clearly stated the means that these godless men used. But it is here that Peter reveals that the acts of the Jews and the Romans were in perfect keeping with God's eternal plan of redemption. 
people's arguments against God many times is they would say that if God truly exists, then why does he allow suffering? If God exists, how come evil exists in the world? They would point to things like war, to death, to murder, to other grievous sins as justification as to why they don't believe that God exists. And yet in the crucifixion of our Lord, what we see is the most evil and heinous of sins that the world could ever imagine. It was God himself being put to death by man. If you want to see the the clearest and the greatest atrocity of justice, the most heinous of crimes, and the most evil, sinful acts of men, look to the cross. Because it is there where man, as an expression of his sinful nature, put to death God in the flesh. As troubling and as excruciating as the evil of this world is, there is no greater act of evil that can be seen or witnessed than in the execution of the second person of the Trinity. And yet amidst those most evil of acts, it's here that Peter tells us that God was in complete control. He says here that Peter makes it clear who it was that gave Jesus over. He says what? Delivered over by the predetermined plan in foreknowledge of the Jews and Romans. That's not what it says. Of who? Of God. Peter here wants us to understand that our Lord's crucifixion did not occur on accident or somehow outside of his sovereign rule. But rather, it came about as the fulfillment of God's predetermined plan of redemption that he created and the eternal counsel of his will from eternity past. It was that plan of redemption that God carried out in perfection that these men desired themselves to carry out in his death. That God did not have to make these men desire to kill Jesus. But in utilizing the acts of sinful man to accomplish his intended purposes for man's salvation, God's eternal plan of redemption was carried out by men who were fully culpable for their acts. It's the culpability of their evil acts then that serves as the justification for the condemnation that Peter gives them here. And it's Peter's condemnation of the Jews for crucifying our Lord that he contrasts then with what? The source of the resurrection. He begins his explanation of the realities of the resurrection after explaining what they had done to Christ with these words, but God. The phrase but God is used throughout the New Testament to show a clear and distinct contrast between the sinful nature, the inability, and the actions of man and what God of his own supernatural power and grace chooses to do. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved upon us, even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, he made us alive with Christ. Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but what? But God was causing the growth. These verses point to the great spiritual reality that it must be the power of God working to bring about what man cannot bring about on his own power and strength. It's in Peter's argument that in contrast to man's desire and his guilt in putting our Lord to to death, it is only the omnipotent hand of God that is the only source of power to bring back Jesus from the dead. And he would do so not just by being the source of Christ's resurrection, but by demonstrating that power next in the surety of the resurrection. The surety of the resurrection It says, but God, what? Raised him up again. Word for surety, according to Webster's Dictionary, means the the state of being sure or certain of something. While man proposes much doubt as to the validity of the resurrection, the scriptures speak of it as clearly and as plainly as it does any other event in scripture. Scripture. 
and is in the whole of Scripture that records for us the validity of and the clear evidence of Christ's resurrection. Turn with me this morning to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and look in verse 3. It's here in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul summarizes three realities of the resurrection. And just to say, this is really another message for another time, but I want to give those three realities to you. The first reality that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3 is, is that Christ actually died. It says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Where did he receive it from? Directly from Christ. And what was that? That Christ died. The Corinthian church that Paul is writing here has been overrun by false teachers many of which were seeking to discredit the Apostle Paul in his teaching. One of those truths that was trying to be undermined was the truth of the resurrection. And so Paul spends the entirety of chapter 15 defending the reality of the resurrection. And he begins his defense with the reality that the fact of the resurrection was a truth that he himself received from the risen Christ. And that first reality, the resurrection that he lays out here, was that Christ actually died, certifiably. He didn't soul sleep. He didn't go into some kind of comatic state, and then once he was placed in the tomb, wake up, he was certifiably dead. How do we know that? Well, Roman centurions under the penalty of death had to certify that their victims of crucifixion were indeed dead dead. We see them carry out this process in the gospel accounts. They do so by plunging that sword into our Lord's side, and upon witnessing the water pouring forth, they truly indicated and certified that he was dead. In addition, the Romans broke the legs of their victims to speed up the crucifixion process by causing its victims to suffocate. But upon, but upon coming to our Lord, they found him to be already dead and not break his legs. But the second evidence of our Lord's resurrection that Paul lays out for us is that the details of his death, his burial, and his resurrection were perfectly fulfilled and perfectly fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. He says this, for I delivered to you as a first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins, what? According to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, what? According to the scripture. Paul says that our Lord's death and his resurrection were in perfect concert with and happened exactly how the Old Testament prophesied that it would. Paul states that our Lord, while apparently dying the death of a criminal from a human perspective, did not die because he had been convicted of a crime. But rather, as we saw last week, the crucifixion served as a propitiation, a payment to God to satisfy his wrath for our sin because of that ledger of sin that we owe to God for transgressing his law. But the Old Testament not only spoke of his death, it also spoke of the uniqueness and the particulars of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, if you work through the book of Acts, both Peter and Paul a number of times pull from these Old Testament prophecies and their defense of the resurrection and of the gospel. First of all, the Old Testament spoke of his death. Genesis 22.8 tells us it foretold in the offering of Isaac by Abraham that Abraham believed God, fully trusting God that he would provide the lamb for sacrifice. The sacrifice in the stead of Isaac, in the stead of sinners. Genesis 22.18, Abraham said, God will provide what? For himself, the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Isaiah 53, 1 through 12, speaks of the reality that was carried out in the crucifixion, that Jesus was despised and forsaken of men, that he was pierced through, that he was crushed, he was chastened, he was scourged, and he was oppressed and afflicted. Psalm 22, as we saw last week, recounting that scene at Calvary, writing some 600 years before the crucifixion, 
The psalmist wrote this, all who see me snare at me. They separate with their lip. They wag their head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. He goes on to say, dogs have surrounded me. An evil band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. It also not only spoke of his death, it also spoke of his burial. Isaiah prophesying some 700 years before Christ of the unique nature of his burial said this in Isaiah 53, 9. His grave was a sign with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah prophesied that in the death of Christ, he would die the death of a criminal, though innocent, and in doing so, he would be with a rich man in his death. Do you recall from Matthew 27, 57 through 60, the evening of our Lord's death says there came a what? A rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who he himself had become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered that it be given to him. And Joseph took the body and he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and he laid it in his own tomb, which he had honed out of a rock. And he rolled a large stone against it, the entrance of the tomb, and went away. It was our Lord who was taken, who was prepared for burial and then buried in the tomb of this man referred to as Joseph of Arimathea, specifically noted by Matthew as a rich man. But the Old Testament not only spoke of the reality of his death, it not only spoke of the reality of his burial, the Old Testament also prophesied of his resurrection. Psalm 16, verse 10, it says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, what? Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Isaiah 53, 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, was that it? No, he says what? He will see his offspring and he will prolong his days. Hosea 6, 2 he will raise him up on the third day. For the Jewish listener of Peter's sermon that day at Pentecost, the concept of resurrection would not have been foreign, but rather a common understanding of what Old Testament prophecy clearly stated. But Paul here provides a third proof of the resurrection. It wasn't just the precision of these Old Testament prophecies coming to fulfillment, but that the resurrection was substantiated by a great quantity and quality of substantiated eyewitnesses. He goes on to say this in verse 5, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James than to all of the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul, upon appearing to, to Peter there, our Lord in his resurrected body appeared to the twelve then gathered in that room, standing in their midst, showing his hands, showing his side. But it wasn't just that he appeared to his closest of disciples. Jesus, over the course of that 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, appeared to more than 500 witnesses. While we're not told who these individuals are, the fact that Paul includes a number indicates a substantiated fact as to how many and that they knew individually who these people were. In fact, Paul says, of those who witnessed our Lord's appearing, while some have died, the majority of those witnesses still existed among the people. It's after appearing to the 12, it's after appearing to the 500, that Paul says that Jesus appeared to all of the apostles at various times. But notice here, he says he also pointed out that he appeared to one particular person in particular, to what? His own half-brother James. James. 
As you recall from our time in Mark's gospel, it was James, the half-brother of our Lord, that showed up there in Capernaum to arrest his brother for fear that he had gone insane. And yet it is here that our Lord appeared to his once skeptical brother to bring him to a saving knowledge of who he was. As Paul closes out his account of the witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, he refers to himself there as Christ appearing to him on Damascus Road. While that he had not been part of the original twelve, instead of persecuting the twelve, the resurrected Christ appeared to him, converted him, and then over the course of the next three years, taught him there in the Arabian desert in preparation for his ministry. It is under the false teaching of those in Corinth that some sought to undermine the truth of the resurrection that Paul writes of as a reality, both in its Old Testament prophetic fulfillments and its eyewitness accounts. The question is why? Why is the resurrection of Christ so crucial to the Christian faith? Simply put, that without the resurrection, there is no Christian faith. Paul would say this in verse 13 of, 15, of chapter 15, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith also is in vain. Paul says that without the resurrection... Without Christ being raised, those spiritual realities of your salvation, your election, your justification, your sanctification, your adoption into the family of God, and your future glorification, they don't exist. Why is that the case? Well, first of all, it was because in the resurrection that demonstrated the Father's approval of the sacrifice of His Son. Paul would say this in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was what? Raised because of our justification. Paul here states that our justification is uniquely tied to Jesus' resurrection. How? What aspect of our justification was seen in the resurrection of Christ? Well, two distinct ways. First of all, Jesus' resurrection proved that God had accepted Christ's sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 15, 16 through 17, For if the dead have not been raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Paul's argument that is, if Christ is still in the tomb, then your faith, your justification, your right standing before God is worthless and you are still in your sins. Christ had not been raised, then his sacrifice could not appease God's wrath. His obedience to the Father somehow fell short of his perfect standard. And the righteousness that he imputes to the sinner by faith is completely worthless. Second aspect of our justification tied to the resurrection is that Jesus' resurrection ensures continual application of his work on behalf of the believer. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says this, Therefore he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Listen, as we sit here this morning, if you are in Christ, you sit under the authority of the one who makes intercession on your behalf to the Father. He was the one who entered death as a perfect and a willing sacrifice, fully satisfying the justice of God. And he is one who God, by his power, raised from the dead, never to taste of death again. He was the one who, in propitiating your sin, that the Father gave personal approval of and fully certified that he had completed the work that the Father had sent him to do. And in raising him from the dead, God provided the sure proof of his satisfaction. It was the Father who, 
who in raising the son from the dead, that demonstrated that the offering of his son, the death of his son, fully satisfied the righteous demands of God. And in doing so, he then can fully justify those who turn from their sin and put their faith in him because of his work on their behalf. It was in raising him from the dead that as the writer of Hebrews tells us, that Jesus then now sits at the right hand of God the Father in glory, in power, doing what? Making intercession on our behalf. It wasn't just at the resurrection that demonstrated God's approval of the death of his son, but also in God raising Christ from the dead, God also affirmed Jesus' rightful position. It's immediately after the context of Peter's words here in Acts chapter 2 as he closes out that sermon that he finished with these final words in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. He says, therefore, that is in light of God's power in resurrecting him, he said what? Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. It was in the resurrection of Christ that God confirmed his son as Israel's true Messiah and Lord. That although they had put him to death through the hands of godless men, it would be God himself who would raise him. And in doing so, he would signify that he gave him two rightful titles. The first of which is that he is Israel's true rightful king. The title for Christ here isn't Jesus' last name. It's a messianic title. The word Christ here means anointed one. It was the Old Testament way of describing him as Israel's true Messiah, their Hamashiach. The one the Old Testament spoke of who would rule his people and the nations with power and prosperity and peace. One who would become greater than King David. Who unlike David who died, this Messiah, this its anointed one, would reign eternally. He would be one who would bring all the nations under the earth, under his rule. And he would usher in the prosperity of God's people. And he would reign in perfect justice and holiness for eternity. Peter explains to those there that day in Acts chapter 2 that in God raising Christ from the dead, that even though his own people had put him to death, God the Father raised him as the sign of his eternal rule, and in doing so, the Father confirmed him as Israel's true Messiah. But notice here, Peter also gives Christ a second title, and that is Lord. The word is kurios in the Greek. It refers to Jesus as the divine and authoritative ruler. It speaks of his absolute sovereignty and authority over all things. It goes beyond Jesus' rightful title among his people who rejected him to encompass all of the created universe, including every single human being. Paul expressed this reality clearly in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, when he said this, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him, there's the resurrection, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, for what purpose? So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Curios to the glory of the Father. Paul describes here the exhaustive and the infinite reach of Christ's lordship. Paul says it was through his death and God's exaltation of his son that in being fully satisfied with his work of propitiation that God resurrected him and put all things under his authority. To say it another way, we would say that now, even as he exists, he is the Lord of all men. That is to say that although men will reject him, that does not mean that he is still not Lord over them. 
That is to say that whether man will bow the knee to him now as Lord and receive mercy and salvation, or in the future they will bow to him as their judge, as their judge. It's Paul here in ending this sermon here at Pentecost that explains that although his people had put Jesus to death, God resurrecting him gave him the rightful place of authority with his people as well as the sovereign over all men. Question is, though, how could God give such a title? How could he proclaim Jesus as both Lord and Messiah? Well, it's because thirdly this morning, the third reality is, is that the Lord is the one who put an end to the agonies of death. Next, I want us to see the sentence of the resurrection. We live in a time when man lives in constant fear of his most dreaded enemies. Some of those are some of the most dangerous and extreme weapons of warfare whether they are nuclear, whether they are cyber, whether they are biological, there are no shortage of weapons that man's enemies can employ in attempting to destroy them. But man, who is created in the image of God, has the greatest of enemies who has employed the greatest of tools. Of course, this morning I'm speaking of death and of Satan. It was last week from the Apostle Paul that in writing to the church there in Colossae, that he encouraged them with the remarkable truth that in the crucifixion, God conquered Satan and made a spectacle of him at the cross. And as believers, we now live positionally in that reality of the victory, and yet there is one enemy that will still need to be put to death in the future, and that is death itself. Revelation 20 through 21 tell us that there will come a time at the end of Christ's millennial reign in which Christ will cast both Satan and death into the eternal lake of fire. It's immediately after that event that he will then create a new heavens and a new earth, one in which John writes in Revelation 21 verse 4 that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no longer any what? Death. Peter teaches us here that it was God through the resurrection of Christ that for the believer who has put an end to the agony of death. Amen. Death is described in three ways in the scripture. First, that man will face a physical death. Secondly, that he is spiritually dead. That is because of his sinful nature. Man is unable to do anything that is spiritually pleasing to God. And thirdly, as those who are sinful by nature, apart from Christ, will face the judgment of God in an eternal state of death and judgment. It's because of their disobedience in the garden that our first parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin. And in sinning, as a consequence of their sin, death entered creation. Spiritual death, that is contamination of sin and our spiritual inability to do anything that is good and pleasing to God. A separation from God because of that sin and a condemnation from God that now belongs to any man because of his sin apart from Christ. Acting as our representatives there in the garden, it was Adam and Eve's sin, their separation from God, and the death that they face that has been imputed or credited to all men. It is this reality of man's sinful nature that makes him one who is constantly living under the condemnation of God. And who upon his physical death, without fleeing to Christ will face an eternity of spiritual torment. This is the agony that apart from Christ awaits all men. Death is brutal. It is unfeeling. It is a violent master. It wreaks pain and suffering through cancer, sickness, suffering, and difficulty. And yet the true agony of death is when the person closes their eyes and its true sting, its full torment and brutality is felt eternally as man passes from this mortal life into his eternal state. 
It is there that while he may have suffered in this life, that the pains of hell constantly, eternally afflict him. It is there under the eternal weight of God's wrath that he lives in constant and crushing agony. It is there that in his flesh he has set aflame with an unquenchable fire that while even as the rich man saw it, he will find no relief. And it is there that although he cries aloud constantly for deliverance, that he will only eternally find himself with a full knowledge of his separation from God. That reality then produces a grinding reality that the scripture says as producing a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. And yet what Paul tells us here is that in God resurrecting Christ from the dead, he has put an end to those agonies of death for the believer. Peter says that God in Christ's resurrection put an end to, that is he loosed, he broke those chains, he dissolved, he undid the agonies of death. That yoke of our sin and our slavery to the pains of eternal torment that became ours through our spiritual fathers and our parents. Christ in tasting of death on our behalf put an end to those pains of eternal death and torment through his resurrection. It was while our Lord tasted death that he conquered it through his resurrection. And in doing so, he did away with death's sting and the eternal torment that once rightly belonged to us. The word for agony is a word that the New Testament uses to describe the pains of a mother in childbirth who in giving birth to her child experiences excruciating pain only to get to an exhilarating moment where she finds the joy of a new life that has been given to her. Peter says, just as a mother who in her time coming to give birth to her child cannot hold the child within her womb any longer, so death under the sovereign power of the Father could not hold our Lord. He was the one who did away with the pains of death and in doing so, through his resurrection, brought the joys of eternal life. If we were to say it in the most simple way that we can, we would say this, it was in the resurrection of our Lord that he secured our own resurrection. The question is, how is this possible How is it that our Lord came to end the agony of death? Well, this morning we have seen the source of the resurrection. We have seen the surety of the resurrection. Thirdly, we have seen the sentence of the resurrection. Lastly, this morning from Peter's pen, I want us to see the strength of the resurrection. Peter goes on to say, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. It's here in Peter's teaching of the realities of the resurrection that Peter teaches us that it was God the Father who in raising him from the dead, it was impossible for Christ to be held in his power. Peter here begins this short section with the word since, meaning he is providing the truth that necessitated the previous reality. He is saying he could put an end to the agony of death because of death's inability to hold Jesus in bondage. He speaks of death's reality to hold Christ in chains as being what? Impossible. The word impossible in the Greek means by no means, not at all. And while our word in English impossible is a good word, it may fall somewhat short of its meaning. It would be better to say it like this, by no infinite means, by no infinite way, under no infinite power could death hold our Lord. Word for power here is the word kratos in the Greek. This is a different word for power that we see often used in the New Testament when it refers to dunamis that we see in the New Testament. The word dunamis, or the word in the Greek for power, is used to refer to God's power to create something out of nothing. 
where dunamis is used in the Septuagint in Genesis 1 to describe God's power to create the world from nothing, as well as in Romans 1, 16 through 17, to describe God's power to give spiritual life to the dead in and through the gospel. But the power here is a different power. The word for kratos speaks not of the power to create, but rather the power to rule and to reign. Word is used in the New Testament sometimes to use to describe Satan's kratos, his power. His power in using death to control and to dominate humanity. That as a result of the fall, men then fell under the curse of sin. And as part of that curse, death reigned through Satan's rule. But the word kratos is translated strength or supreme, supreme strength. And it is most often used to describe the unique nature of God's kratos, his power. What Peter is saying here is that though Satan ruled and reigned in his kratos through the curse of man's sin, holding men captive to death, it was God's kratos that demonstrated itself in the resurrection of Christ and that it did away with Satan's spiritual rule and reign in death. Right of Hebrews explains this reality, a passage we saw last week. 2 verse 14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had, past tense, the power of death, that is, the devil. Writer of Hebrews is saying that in the incarnation of our Lord, in his active obedience, that is fully obeying God's righteous law, and through his death, his passive obedience, in fully satisfying God's wrath for man's sin, and that in accepting the sacrifice of his son, God raised him from the dead, obliterating Satan's power in death. It was the kratos of Satan that while powerful and while reigning over man through the curse, that God, in raising Christ from the dead, demonstrated the unique nature and supremacy of his kratos in conquering Satan in death. It was the Apostle Paul who, in writing to the church in Ephesus, who encouraged them with this great spiritual reality as he prayed for them in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 18 says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his what? Power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. When did that happen? When he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Paul says that once dominating and controlling of Satan and sin that once characterized your life under the curse of sin, that once held you under the spiritual rule and reign of Satan, he says that Christ has been, it has been crushed by the power of Christ's resurrection. But notice also what he goes on to say in that passage. That the same power of God that he demonstrated in resurrecting our Lord and in doing so, ending Satan rule and reign through death. He says, now that same power you have come to know, you have come to enjoy, and now that you live in through Christ. It was in and through the resurrection of Christ that Christ secured his right to his church to take those who belong to the domain of darkness and to bring them into the kingdom of his beloved son. Listen, if you're in Christ this morning, this should bring you some of the most assured understanding of your salvation. 
that it was God's kratos, his divine supreme power, that in resurrecting our Lord and in doing so, conquered Satan's rule and reign under the curse of sin. That the very power and strength of God that raised him from the grave and in doing so ended that rule and reign now belongs to us in Christ. We live as those that Paul says have been what? Crucified with him. That is that we have died to sin and that we now live as whom Christ lives within and whose power indwells and empowers us to godly obedience. This is why every true believer will demonstrate the realities of a changed life. Because as Paul states, it is as if our old self was laid upon the cross and it died with Christ. And with that death of our old self, so did the rule and reign of Satan through death. And we now live as those indwelt by the Spirit, as those who have been made spiritually new and empowered by the power of God in Christ. Matthew Henry, speaking of this power, says this, Christ was in prison for our debt. He was thrown into the bands of death. But divine justice being satisfied, it was not possible he should be detained there either by right or by force. For he had life in himself and in his own power and had conquered the prince of death. The question is this morning, what are our implications from these four realities? First of all, maybe you're not in Christ this morning. What is your response to these four realities well, like all Scripture does, we don't have to look very far to see those implications. Because the men there that day who listened to Peter's sermon explain what your response needs to be. Acts chapter 2, verse 37, at the end of that sermon, it says what? Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and Peter and the rest of the apostles, they said, Brethren, what must we do? These men in coming under the full conviction of their guilt before God for putting Christ to death and the conviction of their sin plead, what must we do to be saved? And what's Peter's response? Verse 38, Peter said to them, what? Repent. Each of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, that demonstration of that reality. Call to those there that day is the same call that Christ gives this morning. That if one is to experience the salvation that God accomplished in and through the resurrection and through the, resur the crucifixion and through the resurrection, then one must be willing to forsake their sin and turn to him. They must be one who is willing to acknowledge that they, in and of themselves, lack any spiritual good before God. That their sin, both by nature and action, deserves the just penalty of God's wrath. And in that understanding, be willing to turn from that life of sin and turn in obedience to Christ. And then notice here the second part of these men's response in verse 41 of Acts chapter two. So then, those who had received his word were baptized. It's not that they were baptized to be saved, but rather they were baptized as a demonstration that they had received his word. Luke's account of Peter's sermon gives clear testimony that these men, upon their guilt and putting Jesus to the death, to death, and upon hearing the glorious truth of God's work in raising him from the dead, believe their message. That is to say that they put their faith in and believed upon Christ. And then what was the result? And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. It was these individuals who, upon coming under the conviction from their sin, turning from their sin, believing upon Christ, were added to Christ's church. They were immediately transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Listen, if you're not in Christ today, may that be true of you today. 
That upon a hearing of the glorious realities of Christ's death and his resurrection, that you would turn from your sin, believe upon the finished work of Christ on your behalf. But maybe you're not an unbeliever here this morning. You are a believer. What's the implication for you? Well, secondly, for the believer, though he will physically die, he will live eternally as Christ himself even now lives. That resurrection morning, our Lord's spirit that had gone to be with the Father in his death was then reunited with his body. And in doing so, our Lord appeared to his own, not as he had been, but in a glorified body. Scriptures give us the great assurance that just as our Lord was resurrected to a glorified body, one that was made never to wear out and was fit for eternity, That one day our own soul will be united to our glorified body and resurrection for the purpose of being fitted for eternity with him. I love how the apostle Paul describes this reality in 1 John 3, verse 2. He says this, Beloved, now we are children of God. That is to say that if you're in Christ this morning, you sit here as one who, as Paul says, who has been crucified with Christ. That is to say that the righteous demands of God's law that you could not keep and the just penalty for transgressing it didn't fall on you, but it fell on Christ. And in the full satisfaction and appeasement of his sacrifice, God raised him from the dead, certifying that he had indeed accepted that sacrifice. And when you turn from your sin, and when you believed in the finished work of Christ on your behalf, God in his grace credited the perfectly righteous life of Christ that you needed to stand before the Father fully justified. It says he did that, that he wiped away that ledger of sin that you owed for the disobedience against him. As John says, he brought us into his spiritual family. He adopted us, not as second-rate children, but as co-heirs with Christ and the glorious riches of our salvation, as Paul points out in Ephesians 3, 6. And it is that reality that if you're in Christ this morning, that has become yours in Christ. And listen, listen, If that were it, it'd be enough, wouldn't it? But listen what John says next. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. John says that right now, even though we enjoy the incredible realities of our salvation in Christ, that we do so in a mortal body. A body that still retains our flesh that constantly calls out to us to sin, a body that is perishable, one that was made for this life and this life alone, and one that is subject to physical death. But John says that although that is our reality now, that is not who we will be for eternity. He goes on to say this, we know that when he appears, we will be like him. John says there will come a time in our Lord's return in which we will experience the culmination of our salvation. That what began in the cross with our sin debt being paid and what God did in putting an end to death through Christ's resurrection, he will bring one day to ultimate fulfillment in our glorification. That we, like Christ, will enjoy the great privilege of having our souls united to our new glorified bodies. Bodies that will never expire, that will not have the confines of our flesh and of its sinful remnant, that will never need to confess sin again, but rather they will be made both physically and spiritually for an eternity of perfect and righteous praise to God in Christ. And listen, 
Listen to the assurance that John gives us of this reality. How, John, how can we be sure that this is going to happen? Because we will see him just as he is. It's in his resurrection, as Paul states in Romans 8, 29, that Christ became the firstborn among many brethren. That is to say that he was the monogenes, the firstborn, in being the first one who was to be resurrected. And listen, one day he is going to come back for his spiritual brothers and sisters. John says in the same glorified state that God resurrected him to and that he appeared to me as John and to many witnesses over that 40-day period. He will return in that same glorified state. And while, we'll be, while we will be made like him, listen, he will still continue to have preeminence over all things for eternity. In his second coming, our Lord will not return to die as a sacrifice, but he will come to rule and reign as Lord of all. In the glory of Christ that if you're in Christ this morning, that you so long to behold, that even now we know of, somewhat veiled, as it were, by our humanity and our sin, we will see and we will worship in perfection for eternity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truthfulness of your word. We thank you for its power. We thank you for the clarity that it brings to the realities not only of our Lord's death, but of his resurrection. That it was that kratos, that power of God that was working there to resurrect our Lord and in doing so, loosening, as it were, the, the bonds of death. That for the believer, they exist as those who, although they die physically, will live eternally with Christ. Father, they can do so because that power is not our own power. Father, we are dead spiritually and of ourselves. Our sinful nature is weak. It can do nothing to please you. And yet, Father, by your work, by your power, Father, as we will turn from our sin and we will believe upon Christ, we can enjoy these great joys of salvation, these great and glorious realities that while we taste them now in Christ, they will become our full reality when we are made like he is. Thank you for that clarity. We thank you for that truthfulness. Father, may we find great encouragement in that reality this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.